We're going to um, come for a time with God's Word now. Find the clicker. And uh, so why don't we ask for him to speak to us through his word? Can we do that together? Heavenly Father, we don't want my words. We don't want human cleverness. We ask for the power of God. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts and minds through your open word this morning? Lord, would you challenge us? Would you transform us? Would you conform us to your image? Would you wash us with the water of your word that we might experience that cleansing power that it has in our hearts? We bring this to you now and say, Holy Spirit, speak. Your servant is listening. Amen. So I'm feeling a little bit of the pressure this morning because Pastor Matt is not well. Pastor Steve's in the Solomon, so it's me. <laughs> but you've been very gracious. Thank you for your care and kindness in at least singing heartily. That's been great. I trust that the Lord has spoken to you through what's already happened in our service. And so we're just going to spend a few minutes from the book of John, chapter 20, the passage that Peter read to us earlier. And it's part of our series that we're calling So Loved. The idea behind this series is as we come to know what it means to be an authentic community, we're looking at each interaction that Jesus had, the significant interactions that Jesus had with people. And we're considering what does his interaction with these people say to us in our community where we are here and now today. So I want to bring you a message called Love Challenges Unbelief. See, uh, I don't know whether you have this problem or not, but as I was reading and studying this passage, it occurred to me that, that I, there's a difficulty I face with some people in life, and you might face it too. I struggle with people who seem to have what I would consider to be a settled unbelief. You know what I'm talking to? People who you, you've tried to talk to about the things of God, and they seem to have had their mind made up, no, no. Not for me. You know, though, you've probably come across people like that. And we kind of think of them as, well, what can I do now? You know, and in our very media-saturated world, we think, you know, if people want to know about Jesus, you know, I've had a go. If people want to know about Jesus, they, all the answers are out there. What can I say that they can't find out for themselves? And you can feel a little bit almost like, well, what's the use? Is there anything that I can do? They're settled. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you haven't. You, you know, you might feel like you've failed because they asked a question, a difficult question. You know the ones, the ones that, that about all the contradictions or the scientific proofs for this and that, and you're kind of like, ah, no, I don't actually have a really good answer for that. Or you struggle with the best answer that you've got, and it just kind of comes out a bit like, no, it just, just didn't cut it. Maybe that's happened to you. Or maybe they come back with a counter and they're really happy with their answer. You know? They've got a really good, strong, solid response to whatever it is that you've said about Jesus and, and so they're settled. Or maybe it's actually they've got to that place where they've said, well, I can see you need it. You know, you Christians, you believe in God because you need like a crutch, right? I, I don't need that, right? But you need a crutch. And, and you kind of feel a little bit belittled, put down, like, you know, you're the stupid one for believing in Jesus. And you can come to that place of thinking, well, what can I do now? It's a bit hopeless. What can little old me do? As we continue our series on So Love Today and we look at this idea of love challenging unbelief, enter Thomas. We heard about him in the Bible reading right at the start. You might know him as Doubting Thomas. Yeah? There's not much worse slander or, or kind of you know, insult that you can say to someone in the Christian church than calling them a Doubting Thomas, is there really? You know, it's up there with the Christian insults. I've been reading some Christian history over the last few weeks, and I tell you what, some of the, some, there have been some pretty good Christian insults over the years, but nonetheless, some of them didn't seem all that Christian, actually, but... Doubting Thomas, you'd think, you know, 
It's a pretty, uh, pretty big slight, but we're going to have a look at Thomas because there's actually a little bit more to the story and maybe we've been a little bit hard on poor old Thomas, calling him Doubting Thomas. See, Thomas's background is a little bit like this. He, when Jesus, um, a few weeks ago we heard the story of Lazarus, when Jesus was going to go and visit Lazarus, and Jesus said, well, Lazarus is dead. Thomas's kind of pessimistic response was, well, why don't we all go and die there too then? Remember hearing that in the story of Lazarus? Well, what are we, we all, let's all go back there and die with Jesus. Now, now, we get the impression that Thomas probably was prepared to die for Jesus, but he was a bit pessimistic about it all. And then a little bit later on when Jesus was in the upper room and he was talking about my father's house where there are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you and you know where I go. And, and Thomas is going, I'm sure they all know God, but I just don't get it. Where, where is it you're going? We don't know where you're going. We're grateful to Thomas though because as a result of Thomas's not quite getting it, we do. Because what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth and the life. He that believeth in me not perish but have everlasting life. Thomas's poor, you know, struggling kind of leads to this great declaration that Jesus gives us that is probably the most quoted Bible verse next to John 3.16 in the Bible. So, you know, poor Thomas has got a bit of a hard rap because God used him to really give us some important truths. But there's a really, really important truth we're going to get to today that comes from John 20. See, Thomas was also part of the all who ran away. We heard last week, Pastor Steve shared about Jesus' crucifixion and everyone abandoned him. We like to think of Peter, you know, because that's where the story went, didn't it? The story goes around Peter and his rejection and denial. But where were the rest? They weren't even in the courtyard. They weren't even following from a distance. Thomas was in the all who took off like a shot. Okay, there's a little bit of background for poor Thomas as we get to our passage today so john 20 verse 19 i'm just going to read a little bit of it and um, not as much as what peter read earlier but this is john 20 verse 19 on the evening of that first day of the week so this is after jesus had died and there'd only been one sighting as far as we know it said that the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hand and his side. It tells us the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, or the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Can you picture it? We've seen him, Thomas. And Thomas says to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were, my hand in his side, I'll not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here in my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. In the NIV it says, uh, sorry, in the, in the um, Holman it says, stop being an unbeliever and believe. See, Thomas had his doubts. 
But I want to point out to you this morning that unbelief is a precondition to belief. You know, we were thinking before about people who say, oh, look, you know, it's not for me. If you think about it, unbelief is a precondition for belief. Someone comes to belief from something, don't they? Unbelief. Everyone who's come to faith has come from a precondition of unbelief into believing. Rather than seeing unbelievers as hopelessly lost today, as we sometimes might, I hope that God will reignite our confidence in their future belief. Because love challenges unbelief. Thomas, calling him doubting Thomas, is a little bit unfair. The other disciples were the same before, weren't they? In verse 19, we read of them gathering together in worship and adoration and expectation. Is that what your Bible said? Are you looking at verse 19? That's not what verse 19 said, is it? What were they doing? Did they gather together in worship and adoration and expectation? No, they were gathered together in unbelief. They were scared. They were fearful and hiding. As far as they were concerned, the Jews had won. Right? Jesus, if anything, was dead and therefore the loser. All of their hopes in him had washed away. They weren't expectant or full of faith. They were hiding behind locked doors for fear of getting dragged away and having the very same thing done to them. You know, when Thomas said, I will not believe unless, how different was he to them before they'd seen? None. I mean, it is a pretty unbelievable claim, isn't it? Dead man walking, right? We don't see that every day. I mean, they had seen Lazarus. That was supposed to inspire their faith. But we don't see dead men walking everywhere, do we? It's not your average, everyday kind of experience. And so Thomas, like most, needed something more. He needed evidence. And it brings us to an important point this morning, that faith is not empty. People talk about blind faith. Well, you might have blind faith, but I don't. Faith is built on something, evidence. In John 20, verse 30 and 31, we read at the, Peter read at the end, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But listen, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What was this book written for? Evidence. The eyewitness wrote it down to give evidence that we might believe in his name. Some of you might know of the, the writer Josh McDowell. You heard of Josh McDowell. Josh, McDowell, Josh McDowell's t- testimony runs a little bit like Thomas's in a, in a, in a way. He was, he was the skeptic of of his age. In fact, he was, he was probably very much like a Richard Dawkins kind of guy when he was in his university years. Vehement against God. He had a reason for it, you see. He had been brought up in an abusive home with an abusive father who was never sober. His father, he said, drank two to three bottles of wine a day. So he had a very difficult home life. His brother, Josh McDowell's brother, successfully sued the family for the abuse that he had faced. You know, as he, when, when his brother grew up, he said, well, this was all rubbish. And he sued his family successfully. And, the, and one of the, the, the rulings of suing his family was that he would get to take a house that was on the property that Josh McDowell's family lived on. He was allowed to take this house. And so the day came to come and take this house and 
Josh had never seen it. He was only 11, had never seen anything like that before. So he was there expectantly looking to see what are they going to do? Like, a, is there a crane? What are they, does every, do we just get 50 people and they all lift? What, how do we move a house, right? And so Josh is there watching, waiting to see what happens. And there's all these people there. And he's thinking, oh, wow, they all think this is great too. See, the thing was, his brother had invited all of the town people. His brother was so spiteful to his parents for their abuse that he had invited all of the townspeople to come and watch on and curse and mock and ridicule his family. So Josh thought they were all there like him to see this amazing feat, but really they had come to cast aspersions on his family, on his parents. And Josh was so rocked by it he was so affected by it that he snapped and he, he ran down to the barn and hid in one of the food troughs up to his neck in the food troughs and said he was there in the barn for two or three hours alone. No one came looking. Siblings, parents, no one. No one came looking for him. And he said at that moment something inside him died. His love for his father, his love for his family, his thoughts towards God all died. Sometime later, when he was in university, um, he was making a nice group of friends. He thought they were all friendly people and they seemed to be actually nicer than all the other people that he, he, he used to hang out with. And, and um, he, he discovered a little bit into the friendship that they were all Christians. And so he immediately the shackles went up because he'd already turned his back on God and abandoned God and the shackles went up and, and he started to be aggressive and defending and whatever. And they said, listen, look, we don't have to prove it to you. You prove to us that it's wrong. They challenged him. You look at it intellectually. You look at it historically. You look at it the way that you would look at any event in history. And then you come and tell us how we're wrong. But you've got to do it with rigour. You know, he was, study, he was studying to, to be a, a, an academic. He said, all right, I will. So he took time off. He, he actually took time off uni to write this book. And he started to write a book that he called Evidence That Demanded a Verdict. And his intention in writing that book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, was to say, and here's the verdict. Rubbish. Disproved. That was his goal. But as he studied... As he applied the academic rigour that was required of any other event in history, he actually discovered that there was more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than pretty much any other event in human history. And so this sceptical God-hater became a believer. The story doesn't actually end there. He... he once he became a Christian, he sent a letter to his father who had, he had hated for his whole life, saying, I love you. He didn't know what that was going to do, but he, he did it. Sometime later, he was in a car accident and left um, in a bed, strapped down. He wasn't able because they were worried about the damage to his neck. So he was strapped down in a bed. And his father came and visited him. And he remembers two things about his father's visit. The first one was, it's the first time in his father's life he'd ever seen him sober. Ever. He came and saw Josh in, in, his, in his bed and he was sober. And the second one they'd never seen his father ever do before was that he was crying. And his father said to him, what's happened to you? After all that I did to you, what's happened to you that you could forgive me and love me? And in a bed, strapped down after a horrific car accident with you know injuries all over him Josh said well I came to know Jesus and he's taught me to forgive and after 45 minutes with his son in that room his father left that room a believer don't be an unbeliever be a believer and you might think well that's pretty good that's a pretty good story right but you know the repercussions of that even go further because Josh McDowell's father became a believer and the town who had come and ridiculed him and mocked him saw the town drunk, a changed man. 
And when Josh tells the story, he says, so many people came to Christ, not through me, but through seeing my father's transformation in Christ. Unbelief is a precondition to belief. In fact, everyone who comes to Christ starts from a position of doubting. It's okay to have doubts as long as we're prepared to examine the evidence with an open mind. So let's do that. In verse 25 of chapter 20, we read the disciples saying to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. That's the best kind of evidence. In fact, it's the easiest kind of evidence any one of us can give. We can say what God has shown us, what God has done in us. But it seems that that wasn't enough for Thomas. Thomas needed a little bit more. In 1 Peter 3.15, many of you can quote it for me, it tells us that we've got to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. What's that saying? Be ready to give evidence. Be ready to give evidence. So what kind of evidence did Thomas receive? Well, we read a little bit later that he, that he got the best kind, the visual evidence. He got to see with his own eyes the resurrected Jesus. He got to put his fingers, well, we don't know that he put his fingers there. In fact, I suspect that the moment he saw Jesus, any thought of putting his fingers in hands and side went, and he just went to his knees. Wouldn't you? I don't think you'd be worrying too much about nail scars anymore, would you? With the risen Jesus right in front of you. So he had visual evidence. There was the eyewitness evidence. The apostles repeated statements. They kept saying it. We've seen it. We've seen it. What other kinds of evidence have you and I received though? We've received God's word. They didn't have that one yet. They were still in the process of collect, writing and collecting all of those things. But we have God's word. They had the testimony of the believing. And like Josh McDowell, they had, we have historic evidence. We can look back and look at the veracity of each of the eyewitnesses. Here's another kind of evidence you might not have thought of. The death of the disciples. I mean, everybody dies, but most of the disciples died in a particular way. You know they all died as martyrs. All but one died as martyrs. That is, they were killed for their declaration of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you could, say, if you could save your life simply by saying he didn't die, he didn't rise... And that would save your life. right? What benefit would there be if they were lying? Like, Let's say they were lying. He didn't, we didn't really see him. Right? There might be some benefit in saying that when you're living because you might convince other people to follow your movement and give you money. right? But if you're going to die, what benefit is there then? If you, if you didn't really see the resurrected Jesus, what point would there be in saying he's alive if you hadn't seen it? None. The fact that they died as martyrs, declaring that Jesus is raised from the dead, we've seen him and we're prepared to die for that truth, is evidence that it really happened. Then like Josh McDowell's dad, we have the evidence of changed lives. People we can point at and see, see, once they were lost, but now they're found. Then you've got this thing, the growth of the church. You know, from 12... Across the, across the generations to millions and millions of people. Especially when it was trying to be stamped out pretty much everywhere they went. This crazy Jewish sect called the Way. They were trying to wipe it out and it kept on growing. And then there's finally, there's this little bit of evidence I'd like to suggest to you. It's a bit of a logic kind of argument more than it is evidence. It's called Pascal's Wager might have heard of it. Pascal's wager goes something like this. It's a logic argument. It says, if God doesn't exist, then you can flip a coin, really, one way or the other. If, if it's not true that God exists, then you can flip a coin whether you're going to believe or not. Because if God doesn't exist, what do you lose when you die? Nothing. You just had what you had, lived how you lived, and then you're dead. Right? But if the other side is true, if God is real 
and you're just flipping a coin, what are the implications if you get it wrong? They're serious, aren't they? So even from a logic argument, it actually makes more sense to choose. If you're not sure, it makes more sense to choose to believe. Because if God exists, your only chance of winning eternal happiness is to believe. And your only chance of losing it is to keep that unbelief. The third thing we see from this passage is the response to the evidence. Thomas responds when Jesus shows up. Jesus says, touch my scars, touch my side, touch my hands. And, and at the sight of it, Thomas falls to his knees and he worships. And you know what he said? Thomas actually gives us, well, I'm so glad Thomas doubted. I can be honest and say I'm glad that Thomas doubted because as a result of Thomas's difficulty again, we get the most powerful declaration of Christian doctrine yet in the New Testament. You think we've had lots. There's lots of good stuff in the New Testament, right? It, nothing tops this. What Thomas says is one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. Are you ready for it? He says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Up until this point, people had said kind of godish things about Jesus, but no one had actually declared it with the kind of vehemence that Thomas did. For instance, uh, Peter, when he came to that, uh, he, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's kind of Godish, right? That's kind of like saying he's kind of like God. Yeah. And, and Martha at Lazarus' um, um, uh, uh, death, she said something very similar. I know that you are the Christ who is come in, coming into the world. Kind of Godish, coming in from somewhere else, like. And even Jesus himself had said something very Godish when he said, before Abraham was, I am. But no one tops this. He goes to his knees and declares, my Lord and my God. What a powerful, powerful truth that comes out of this passage. Most powerful declaration of Christian doctrine yet. My Lord and my God. Do you know why no one else had said it? No one else had said it because it was a death sentence pretty much to anybody else. It was a stoning offence. It's actually the reason the Jews stoned Jesus. They stoned Jesus. They couldn't get anyone to actually say it out loud, so they had to actually get people to lie about it. That's how they actually got in there. They said, you know, he, that's how they actually got to the place where the Jews were ready to kill him. Because they said he thinks he's God. But no one actually said it out loud until Thomas. So maybe we're a bit rough on poor old doubting Thomas. Thomas is first. Augustine, one of the church fathers, said that Thomas doubted so that we might believe. It's clear as a bell. My Lord and my God. Jesus is God, folks. State it as clearly as that. Thomas came to the clear understanding, and so can we. There are, this is the place where a lot of religious sects and groups and cults kind of diverge, this idea. Is Jesus God? They all play lots of games with Thomas. Jesus is God. And Thomas says two things, my Lord and my God, my Lord, my Sovereign, my Ruler, my Guider, my Teacher, and my God, my Creator, my Owner, I worship you. Jesus is both the one who teaches us and the one that we worship. So, what, what can we get from this for us today? How do we respond to this ourselves? Do you need more evidence for your faith? In some places, it's not a good idea to ask the difficult questions. Oh, no, we don't ask those kinds of questions around here. You know, if, if the Bible can't stand up to questions being asked of it, then we're in trouble. Because it is a reasonable faith, anchored in history and truth and real events that really took place. You can ask the questions. Seek it out. 
If you need evidence, seek it out. Examine it. Do what Josh McDowell did. Put it through the rigor of asking questions. Be specific. Seek to have your questions answered. Jesus said in verse 27, Don't be an unbeliever, but a believer. Can I challenge anyone who might be here today in unbelief? Seek out the evidence for yourself. Look, examine and find. But there's a second challenge for you and I today and it's this. Do you have evidence that you can share? Have you experienced something of the power of God in your life that you could tell others about? In verse 21, we read again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. That's our standing marching orders. The church is not supposed to be a closeted, protective community hiding away from the dangerous world. That's what the disciples were doing in the upper room with the door locked. Is that a picture of our church? The disciples hidden in the upper room? (laughs) Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit and said, As the Father sent me, so I send you. The challenge to us is, have you got evidence, faith that you can share? See, if we're going to be an authentic community, we have to see that like the disciples... It's a community that's supposed to be reaching out. Next term, we change our emphasis onto bearing hope. It's really important that we get this. Because unbelief is a precondition to belief. Everybody out there who doesn't know Jesus, they're ready. They're in the right place for their unbelief to turn to belief. If we will be the authentic community of Jesus that doesn't hide in a closet but goes out to reach them with the gospel. What if? What if? See, the reason lots of people haven't been coming to faith, maybe, because we haven't been presenting our faith story to them. Maybe we haven't been like the disciples saying to Thomas, we've seen Jesus. And maybe we're too scared of their first response. Unless I see, I'm not going to believe. God, what if they say something I don't want to hear? What will I do then? Love challenges unbelief. It might be that we haven't been presenting our story. Maybe we haven't been giving the evidence that's necessary for them to come to Jesus. You know, they cannot come if they have not heard. What if? What if overnight we all made the decision that tomorrow all of us were going to start sharing the evidence that we have with the people we come into contact with? Tomorrow, what if overnight, do you think this would be a different place next week? What if love bears hope The final thought I want to give to you is this. I know some of you have unbelieving family, unbelieving spouse, unbelieving partners, unbelieving children. I want to show you a final video from another author who you will have heard of named Lee Strobel. And Lee makes the point I think we all need to understand. You aren't just the one giving evidence. You are the evidence. You're part of the evidence that people need to believe. So live what you believe. When confronted with evidence, everybody has to make a a stand one way or the other, don't they? Is it true or not? That's what happens when you're confronted with evidence. Here's the takeaway thought for this morning. Oh, you ready for the video? Can you just go back to the slide for me, Tony? Next slide. Just before the video. Next slide. I was winding up to this and now we're waiting. You're expecting? 
ready. Here it comes any second. The next slide. No, not the video. Not yet. Next slide. Not the video. Just, just minimise the video. Just talk amongst yourselves quietly. So click on the slide for me. That's it. Right. <laughs> this is the point we're supposed to take away with us today before we see the video. Evidence of Jesus' divinity, the thing that Thomas came to the understanding of, my Lord and my God. When we actually get evidence of that, you know what it leads to? Belief, worship, and devotion. All the things that Thomas did when he came into the presence of the living Christ. Evidence of Jesus' divinity Understanding that he is God leads to belief, worship, and devotion. We're going to um, we're going to see this video, and then we'll close. Well, for most of my life, I was an atheist. I thought the idea of an all-loving, all-powerful creator of the universe, I thought it was stupid. I mean, my background's in journalism and law. I tended to be a skeptical person. I was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. So I needed evidence before I believe anything. One day my wife came up to me, she had been agnostic, and she said after a period of spiritual investigation, she had decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, you know, this is the worst possible news I could get. I thought she was going to turn into some sexually repressed prude who's going to spend all of her time serving the poor in Skid Row somewhere. I thought this was the end of our marriage. But in the ensuing months, I saw positive changes in her values, in her character, in the way she related to me and the children. It was winsome and it was attractive. And it made me want to check things out. So I went to church one day, uh, mainly to try to see if I could get her out of this cult that she's gotten involved in. But I heard the message of Jesus articulated for the first time in a way that I could understand it. That forgiveness is a free gift and that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that we might spend eternity with him. And I walked out saying, I was still an atheist, but also saying, if this is true, this has huge implications for my life. And so I used my journalism training and legal training to begin an investigation into whether there was any credibility to Christianity or to any other world faith system for that matter. I did that for a year and nine months until November the 8th of 1981. And on that day, I realized that in light of the torrent of evidence flowing in the direction of the truth of Christianity, it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. Because to be an atheist, I would have to swim upstream against this torrent of evidence pointing toward the truth of Jesus Christ. And I couldn't do that. I was trained in journalism and law to respond to truth. And so on that day, I received Jesus Christ as my forgiver and as my leader. And just like with my wife, my life began to change over time. My values, my character, the purpose of my life began to be transformed over time in a way that, as I look back, I can't imagine staying on the path I was on compared to the adventure and the fulfillment and the joy of following Jesus Christ. So, um, folks, next term we're focusing in on bearing hope, being those who bring hope to others. And what we want you to do in the remaining weeks this term is start to pray, start to think, Start to dream, who, Lord, have you put in my life who's in that perfect, necessary condition of unbelief that I can bring to the Saviour? And next term, we're going to be running Alpha. Alpha is a course that is both for people who already know Jesus and want to kind of refresh their understanding of the basics, but it's also a place where non-believers, people who are wanting to examine the evidence, can come and look and ask and discuss and come to a place of finding Christ for themselves. And we would like you all to think about who you could bring along to Alpha next term. Let's pray about that as we close now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Thomas, who over the ages has copped a bad rep, as a doubter. But we thank you that because of his doubting, we can get it. You are our Lord and our God. Lord, we want to pray for those people that we know who don't know you yet, who are in that place of unbelief. Lord, we want to ask that you will put on our hearts the ones that you are reaching through us. Lord, that we might be the ones who are able to give evidence and then when the time comes, Lord, that we might be able to invite them to come along to Alpha, that they might receive the good news of the gospel 
and come to faith in Christ. But Lord, it's our burning desire not to be hidden away and locked in a cupboard, but to be a visible light for Jesus in our world. We thank you for reaching in to us and presenting us with your amazing grace. Amen.